by accident, really. But the more I've learnt about it, I've found there is no, no one route. I think it's different for every conflict and every war artist that uh, ends up going out there. My one, my route was, I'd worked a lot for the Times newspaper and I did a lot of drawings on location for them. And it was after the Bishopsgate bomb in London and I was with the editor of the Times in this bombed out church that they were trying to raise money to rebuild. And I was having a chat with him that I was in the army reserves and I'd love to go and draw a, a natural disaster, a sort of post-earthquake, instead of sending photographers, why not send an, an artist to record post-disaster, flood, tsunami, or a war? And he kind of thought, mm, good idea. And it was about three years later that I got a call going, Matt, what are you doing uh, next week? Do you want to come out to Kuwait and come and draw in Iraq for the war? So that, that was my route in. For us outsiders, that sounds an incredibly brave or rash thing to do. I mean, how close to the action do you get? Um, yes, it was a bit rash. Uh, I, I was sent on a hostile environment course, but it was run by three SAS guys. And that's when the reality began to, to dawn on me because of the threat of biological and or nerve agent weapons. Um, just the threat of it was, was quite terrifying. So I went into the Times newspaper the next day, they gave me some body armour, a helmet, um, a first aid kit, quite a comprehensive first aid kit, and some atropine injectors against anti-nerve agent um, injectors. But if you get your diagnosis wrong, you can die from atropine poisoning. So it was a fine balance between <laughs> self Yes, that's when the reality dawned on me. It's like, oh my God, what have, I, what have I got myself into? So are you on the front line with a sketchbook rather than a gun? Yes, yes. Um, in my talk, I've, I've took some very shaky um, camera footage on my camera. Yes, I'm in, I'm in muddy ditches being shot at and um, trying to sketch. So after the, the trip to Iraq, I then got mobilised back to Iraq with the reserves and then Afghanistan came, and it was almost every year I'd go to Afghanistan, and it became normal to... It's only now, looking back with a bit of hindsight, it became normal to go out there. You could get shot at from it. There wasn't really a front line. It was known as a sort of 360-degree battlefield. You could get shot at or blown up from any direction, and it became normal. What part of that conflict are you expected to record, or do they leave it to you to draw what inspires you? Yes, I was left completely, completely free, free reign, because no one can predict what access I'll get, what, yeah, basically what access I could get. So completely left, I was sort of rudderless or going by my own instincts. Uh, Afghanistan was different because it was too dangerous to step outside of the bubble of UK or American forces. So, so that one I was, I was with, with the army all the time. So I saw a slightly different angle of the conflict. Whereas Iraq, I was free wandering. I could drive off and uh, yeah, see both sides, see the civilian side and see the military side. What attracts you in terms of what <laughs> you draw in a situation like that? I've, I've wondered myself, I just have a heart, an instinct. I just see something and my heart, heart rate will speed up and I just have to draw it. So uh, what it is, I can never predict. I quite like tatty stuff, tatty, so blown up tanks and, or people working, um, which is the sort of army in the RAF. There's just people always working on kit or equipment or building bases. Um, so for me, that was, that was ideal. How did the serving soldiers react to you, a man with a brush or a pencil rather than a gun? Um, God bless them, British soldiers kind of uh, just accept whatever comes at them. Uh, no day was the same in either theatre. The, the British or the British Army have quite a tradition of having officers' messes full of paintings uh, commemorating various tours. So does the sergeant's mess. So to have a, a war artist along made him bat an eyelid. It was just another 
yeah, after five or ten minutes, they'd stop posing and then kind of relax and then not notice me. So, yeah, they were fine. You are in many ways the latest in a line of great war artists stretching back through two world wars. Is that a responsibility that sits heavily on your shoulders? I don't class myself in the same genre, but I tried not to think about that. I was so worried about doing my own drawings. I, I just couldn't, no, that would be too daunting to try and put myself in that historic What, what about your attitude to war, Matthew? How is that influenced by being there on the front line? I'm neither for it nor against it. I've got, I think I now realise it's almost an inevitable part of human nature, for better or for worse. I think it brings out some amazingly good things in people and also some atrocious things. So it's just a part of us. And I... So I'm not overtly anti-war, neither am I pro. So I, I, I went out trying to record the reality of it, I guess. I, I had no idea what to expect. Um, yeah, it was just maybe my own journey, just trying to work it out, make sense of it. We live today in an era of instant images, photographic images. Um, how does your work compare with that? I mean, it's a completely different way of looking at life as it is, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the first trip to Iraq, I had a, a scanner and a satellite phone, so I'd scan my drawings that I did daily, which is exactly what the photographers, war photographers, were doing. So I was almost used as a war photographer, but I would do drawings. Um, I, I guess I wasn't so much after the shooting and the... The guns and bullets, were, yeah, that was interesting, but I couldn't convey it in a drawing. That, the TV cameras can do that better, the noise, the violence of it. However hard I tried, it still looked very static and I just couldn't convey it. So, but where where strength of drawings came through was the boredom, the checking equipment, the, the non-stop hard graft, the laying around. Uh, surviving the climate, everything else that went with soldiering and maybe doesn't come across so well in photographs. So maybe I took a different angle. Well, it, it, it's, it's your angle on reality. It's yes. your reality. Yeah. Yes. You come home and you look back at just what you've done. Um, did that give you the shivers? I mean, were there moments when your life was in real danger? That all sounds a bit dramatic. I'm, I'm, I don't want to make so, so... Yes, I was shot at and mortared and rocketed, but so were all the other troops I was with. So, uh, as I said, it became normal. It's only now, yes, maybe after a gap of sort of eight or nine years looking back on it, thinking, my God, I was a bit naive to go through all that. But also, humans adapt quickly. If you're terrified all the time you just wouldn't be able to cope it just became normal and you uh, I think it was the same with the troops you kind of accept okay chances are I hope I die quickly I hope I don't want to be mangled up in an IED but you just accept it and do everything you can to stop it but end of the day <laughs> yeah, that's the risk you're taking um, in terms of legacy I mean there have been many famous war photographers and there are many photographic images from past conflicts that are iconic. But is there a feeling that um, a painting uh, is a much more lasting and valuable thing than just photographic images, which we see one after the other after the other? I mean, is there a feeling that at some point in the future, when we are dust, that there is a work of art that you've done uh, from those days of conflict which is really valued hanging on a wall somewhere that's hard to answer <laughs> i'd love to think so the national army museum uh, have bought many of my drawings uh, as a record so there'll be some archivists going through in 300 years time going oh my god look look that's 
They had plastic toilets and, and, <laughs> and that's how they survived. And conversely, I looked through their archives at some of the previous Afghan conflicts. And okay, there weren't, weren't photographs, but there were these prints. Yes, maybe I sort of saw an archivist in two or three hundred years time looking at it the same way, going, oh gosh, this drawing, someone's actually either been there and drawn it, it's got grubby fingerprints on it, and someone's been there in the dust, and it's a more personal view. And it's somehow I look at it longer than a, a photograph. Um, whether other people do, I'm not sure. Uh, so there's you balancing a, a, a palette of watercolours on, on your knee with gunfire and explosions all around you, trying to paint a, a, a straight line. <laughs> um, I had to learn to draw very fast. I ended up doing black and white line drawings for the sort of kinetic or moving, moving subject matter. And I, I sort of had to learn that out in theatre. I, I just had to think, how am I going to record this? So my sketchbooks are full of these scribbly line drawings. Not very many of them work. Some are atrocious, but they were drawn in the moment with a slightly shaky hand or... Um, yeah, there, there usually wasn't time to get my inks out and settle down. But the other, other locations or other... Other times there was, everything was very subdued and I had time to And you, you, as I understand it, you didn't always have water available for mixing your colours. <laughs> You've done your research. Um, yes, there was, a, there was a time, I was in Iraq, I was husbanding my water. Uh, I, I only had a couple of litres in my day sack. So I did have to pee into a bottle and paint using my own urine. And I, I picked up a rather bad habit from my father of licking brushes to get a point, and I, I tried to stop doing that. <laughs> that that's and I'm not going to say which drawings I drew in human urine. <laughs> that's a whole new angle on piss art. <laughs> yes. Now, listen, I mustn't dismiss your illustrious career because it doesn't all revolve around a theatre of, of war. Um, you're an excellent Martin student with a long career, um, quite something um, that I could in fact say, and I will do probably in the link, uh, that you've gone from Ascot to <laughs> Afghanistan, because well, like wasn't it. Royal Ascot one of the typically British scenes you did for a, um, uh, a catalogue of stamps for the Royal Mail? You have a done series, a research. A series of It stamps. was a series, of, a summertime series of stamps on the British season. Um, yes, I've done stamps for submarines, uh, centenary, um, yeah, all sorts of curious jobs. I've been to North Korea drawing for Condé Nast magazine and when Americans weren't allowed that year. Um, yeah, it's, it's varied and intriguing. <laughs> uh, no day's the same. A married man with kids of his own, have your travelling days come to an end now, Matthew? Are, are your drawing talents... Uh, directed elsewhere. Covid put a put a stop to a lot of that. So I'm hoping I love travel, and I'm just hoping somehow I'll wrangle wrangle more work abroad. Uh, sadly, budgets and everything is just a bit tighter, and just life is a bit tougher at the moment. So we'll see what happens. Um, it's a pleasure meeting you today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.